These strange birds are kiwis and they live in New Zealand. Yet very few New Zealanders have ever seen a live one, for they stay deep in the mountain forests and come out only at night. Kiwis are definitely queer birds. They cannot fly for they have only stumps instead of wings. Their feathers are hair-like and their nostrils at the tip of the beak instead of at the base. To cap all, the female lays an enormous egg for her size. Then she refuses to hatch it and lets father do the work. With all these accomplishments, it's small wonder that New Zealanders are proud of their national bird. And here's a kiwi that's been in trouble. He was caught in an opossum trap and has lost a leg. He's been sent to this game farm, where those other kiwis live, to be looked after. The curator of the farm is a resourceful man and has made an artificial leg for his patient. It's a bamboo tube complete with rubber joint and packed with cotton wool. The kiwi finds his peg leg helpful and it certainly widens his range in worm hunting. Kiwis aren't New Zealand's only native birds and to see others, this American naturalist, Dr. Olaus J. Murray, is crossing to the bird sanctuary of Kapiti Island. Kapiti was originally a Maori fortress and 130 years ago, a busy whaling station. The old tripods used by the whalers for rendering down the blubber are relics of those rugged days. Lying three miles off the mainland, Kapiti is an ideal sanctuary for both land and seabirds can easily seek shelter here. For many of the seabirds, such as the red-billed gull, it's a nesting place. Dr. Murray is director of America's Wilderness Society and methods of bird protection are one of his special interests. His first discovery is a rockhopper penguin, another of the seabirds that breed here. Penguins are very numerous on the New Zealand coasts and penguin colonies are found on many of the outlying rocks and islets. With nobody to frighten them, the birds become very tame and the caretaker of the island introduces his visitor to the rarely seen kaka, or New Zealand parrot. Also seen is the inquisitive weka, or wood hen, another of New Zealand's flightless birds. Few birds are tamer than the tui. This favourite of both the deep forest and the domestic garden is famous for his liveliness and for his skilled imitation of other birds' calls. His numbers are increasing a result of New Zealand's policy of looking after her native birds. In all the geyser areas in New Zealand, the Earth's internal heat lies very near the surface. Hot water and steam come seeping and bubbling and surging up, as if from giant subterranean boilers. This is rainwater that has saturated the rocks below. There it has dissolved out many minerals and been heated by high temperature gases rising from the Earth's molten interior. Here is one of the natural resources of New Zealand that has so far been neglected, except from a tourist point of view. It's an unlimited potential of heat and energy, which the country is only now beginning to learn how to harness. The Maoris have always made good use of the hot water and steam in a simple and practical way. In the thermal areas, they've adapted their way of living to make the best use of the hot springs. But hot springs are only the local outcroppings of vast reservoirs of hot water that lie underneath the whole area, underneath the streets and gardens and backyards. In Rotorua, in the last few years, a start has been made to tap this geothermal heat and put it to a variety of uses. The first step is the drilling of a well. The hot water lies at different levels in different parts of the town. For a good pressure, it's usually necessary to drill three to four hundred feet. At that level, most wells gush by themselves without the need of a pump. 
And here she blows 70 pounds to the square inch and 1,200 gallons an hour. The temperature of the water is close to boiling point, but the steam and gases are often well above this. The first and obvious use of hot mineral water is for baths and medicinal purposes. From these vats, hot water is fed to the famous blue baths, along with cold water from the town supply. Warm swimming baths of this kind have always been a popular attraction. But it's the townspeople of Rotorua who have been most inventive in their use of hot water. A number of houses are equipped with little sub-swimming baths like this. A pool in the garden that's hot night and day would normally place its owner in the millionaire class. The steam is utilised as well. Steam cooking boxes are the natural counterpart of the pressure cooker. The food cooks in record time, and those people who've tasted it say there's nothing to equal the flavour. Natural steam and hot water have one serious drawback, however. The corrosion of the pipes that carry them. Constant replacement would be too expensive to make indoor plumbing an economic possibility. This difficulty has now been solved by a device called a heat exchanger. It's a jacket of hot mineral water surrounding pipes from the town supply. The cold water is thereby raised to the same temperature. The heat exchanger is considered the greatest technical advance so far in the utilization of natural heat. It has made it possible to supply constant and pure hot water to all types of premises and for all kinds of uses. The only expense for a household supply is the initial outlay of the well and the heat exchanger. After that, hot water, sometimes even boiling water, is at hand from the tap or in the central heating, day and night, year in and year out. Natural central heating at the Rotorua School has saved a 12 and sixpence a day fuel bill for six years, and it's still going strong. There are other uses. Natural heat is found to be more reliable and less subject to power cuts than electricity and it's beginning to be used by agriculturists in the district. Rotorua may have a great future as a hothouse and nursery area if this idea is developed further. Throughout the town there are many buildings that make use of the natural heat. Some wells have been installed for several years and the saving in fuel has been enormous. Altogether there are about 100 wells in the town and more being bored every week. The next step is to consider the possibilities of a community supply to the town as a whole. To further this idea, a hot water committee has been elected by the townspeople. It has drawn up a plan for an experimental street supply. The borough council has approved the plan and hopes to put it into operation soon. Here is the plan. The houses on both sides of a street are to be supplied from one well. Boiling water from the well will pass through a heat exchanger where it will heat town supply water coming from a pump. The hot water main then passes up the street and back again. From this a supply is piped to each house, with a surplus running back to the return main. Each house will receive at least 60 gallons a day of hot water, more than enough for all purposes of washing and heating. A constantly circulating supply of pure hot water. If this experiment is successful, the reticulation of the whole town may well be considered. Are there even more ambitious plans are afoot? Up till now, heat has been the only consideration. The next step is to harness the power. Vulcanologists from the Geological Survey and engineers from various government departments are at present studying the problem. In particular, they're interested in the great power stations at Ladarello in Italy. These large stations generate electricity from natural heat in an area that has nothing like the resources of the Rotorua region. Whether a similar scheme will be possible here has yet to be seen. Certainly, measured by human standards, the supply is practically inexhaustible. New Zealand's experiments will be among the most interesting in the development of her natural resources.